Hey guys, this is Eric with FlightBridge Ed, and uh, we're gonna do a two to three part session on uh, ventilator management and cellular um, oxygenation. Um, so with that being said, I'm not gonna go into um, um, depth on um, cellular oxygenation. I plan on doing a few podcasts um, on that subject uh, specifically, um, but I will hit that a little bit in this presentation because I feel like it's important to understand that. Um, we will um, again do this in a few parts. I think this is there's a lot of information in this in this uh, podcast, this presentation. Uh, I know this subject is um, uh, a big deal for a lot of people. A lot of people don't have uh, the experience with ventilator management. I know it's a big jump when you get into the flight uh, arena or critical care uh, medicine uh, as it relates to ventilator management. So um, I'll kind of do this again in a few parts uh, to try to break it apart. Uh, we will talk a little bit about anatomy of the upper and lower airways. Uh, I'm not going to hit that real hard. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the aspects of gas exchange and uh, uh, cellular oxygenation. And uh, I'm going to hit uh, on the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve and how it relates to our patients. Um, we'll hit the modes of ventilation. Uh, we'll talk about um, uh, how those affect the subsets of patients and how to approach those. Um, and then um, we may... Uh, I haven't decided yet. Talk a few uh, on a few different patient scenarios um, and apply those. So let's get started. Again, I'm not going to hammer on the anatomy. We all know the anatomy of our, our airway real, real hard. I, I will start talking about the mechanics of breathing, uh, how it relates, um, and we got to remember that when we breathe, our diaphragm contracts um, and our diaphragm contracts downward, and this causes a higher pressure inside our chest cavity. And why that's important is that this allows air to flow into the lungs uh, with very little effort. Um, in contrast, when we talk about our ex, uh, expiration process, the expiration phase is, is, is not a um, very easy physiologic process. It takes more work. And thus, when you talk about COPD asthma patients, that's where they get into trouble because that, that blowing off that CO2, that exhalation process, is, um, is more difficult. So just remember, when, when our diaphragm contracts, it draws in air just automatically. It, you know, you, you go from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. Um, so uh, the inspiration process is a very easy process. The exhalation process is an active process. Um, when we talk about oxygenation versus ventilation, I know that that's something that can be confusing to a lot of people. Um, Oxygenation is the process of gas exchange. And that's the process of, of oxygenating our tissues, um, the oxygen um, coming in, jumping onto the hemoglobin, a CO2 molecule jumping off, and, and we have gas exchange. Um, with that being said, ventilation is the process of maintaining an adequate PaCO2. And so um, an example of that, an example of the differences of the two. And, and the only way I can really um, explain this is, uh, let's say you have a patient that's that's on a ventilator, he's uh, got a traumatic brain injury, and they're trying to determine if, they, if the patient's brain dead. So what they'll do is they'll put a patient on CPAP, and they'll uh, take an initial blood gas, They'll, they'll decipher that blood gas, so they'll document and, and look at their uh, the patient's uh, PO2, and they'll look at the patient's um, PaCO2, okay? So our normal range for our PO2 is any, anywhere from 80 to 100, and our normal range for a PaCO2 is going to be 35 to 45. All right, so th they're going to do this, you know, over 10 or 15 minutes, and they're going to, again, have a patient on CPAP. They're going to turn down um, the any any aspects of it that will actually ventilate the patient. So the the patient has to try to initiate ventilation. And we know that in CPAP mode, uh, the ventilator does not give a breath. The uh, To have a true CPAP mode, the patient has to be breathing on their own. So that's the whole purpose of this mode in, in this setting. So during the study, they watch the, the SATs. And the SATs will always stay excellent. Um, because again, you have positive pressure. You got positive pressure blowing in oxygen uh, down into the, the, the lungs. You have gas exchange that's occurring, um, and, or I should say you have partial gas exchange. You have oxygen that's, that's getting down there. Um, 
what will happen though is, is that over time the patient cannot blow off that CO2. The patient is not having a full um, inhalation exhalation process. So the CO2 will start to climb. Okay, and so what they'll do is they'll take another blood gas in you know 15 minutes or so, and if if there's a sharp increase in uh, PaCO2, then they know that the respiratory centers are dead. Um, remember that the respiratory centers are located in the medulla. They control automatic um, um, our automaticity uh, to breathe, and that's based on a CO2 um, level, our CO2 receptors. Okay, so. That is that is how they decide if a patient's brain dead, and so that's a good example of a patient being sufficiently sufficiently oxygenated, but having ventilatory failure. We see ventilatory failure uh, in COPD and asthma patients. That's where we see that where it's not an oxygenation problem, but they uh, have the inability because of uh, respiratory muscle fatigue um, to blow off that CO2. So they start stacking breaths. They start um, having auto peep. They start uh, their alveoli get very engorged. They start having, um, you know, uh, alveolar trauma. The, the, the little alveoli burst and, and break, and they become brittle. And they start having extreme problems because of that. So your lower airways, um, as it relates to this presentation, we're just basically going to talk about our alveoli. Uh, we're going to talk about our capillary beds and, and gas exchange. So the respiratory patholog pathology as it relates to this, um, basically we take in a breath, right? Um, and oxygen is, is basically diffused into the bloodstream through the process of diffusion. Um, your oxygen molecule comes down um, as we take a breath. It jumps on to the... Um, Hemoglobin, the CO2 molecule jumps off and ex exhaled out of the out of the um, out of the body. And so, to kind of give you an example of gas exchange and what it is, is, is think about um, a gas exchange happening um, in the alveoli, and that alveoli has an alveolar membrane. Okay, so imagine that alveolar membrane being a glass door. So you have a a glass door in your in your, let's say, your kitchen, you have a big, huge uh, French doors with glass doors. Um, and imagine that glass door being um, clean. There's no problems. Uh, there's nothing blocking that. And so all those oxygen molecules that are down there, they're, they're colliding with that alveolar membrane. And thus, gas exchange occurs in that process. Oxygen molecules jump off. The CO2 molecules, um, or excuse me, oxygen molecules jump on. The CO2 molecules are excreted out of the lungs uh, via convection. Okay, so any time we have um, a block of those glass doors, um, that's what's called a shunt. And when you talk about a shunt, we're talking about anything that impedes gas exchange. So Always try to think of alve the alveolar membrane or the alveoli as glass doors. How are we going to make those glass doors bigger? How are we going to make the glass doors uh, clean, uh, free of obstruction? And I think that's a really easy way to understand what's going on there. We want a nice, clean glass door. We want a big um, um, amount of surface area for gas exchange to occur, and that's happening in in many in you know thousands of little alveoli sacs. So diffusion is basically what happens at that level at that alveolar membrane. So with the analogy of the glass door, always think about a clean glass door again, or a glass door that is unobstructed from view. Any deviation from this will result in some type of shunt or VQ mismatch. So again, remember to try to make that lar surface larger. The s larger the surface area, the more opportunity we have for gas exchange. And so that is exactly what we're going to try to do when we start, start implementing um, our ventilator management strategies. So what causes a VQ mismatch? We talked about obstructing that glass door. Okay, So anything that stops or slows down oxygen diffusion is a VQ mismatch. And it could be as simple as as um, you know, auto peep in a COPD patient, um, asthma patient, 
It could be a trauma situation where they have a, a tension pneumothorax that's uh, compressing on a, a little alveolar sacs. There's no gas exchange happening. We have this increased interthoracic pressure. It's impeding on the, the, the great vessels, um, uh, causing decreased venous return, etc. Um, a pneumonia patient where you have um, all this fluid, uh, nasty fluid-filled sacs um, that's not allowing gas exchange to occur. It's blocking that that uh, glass door. Just imagine it kind of being caked with mud. Um, you know, uh, your kids have thrown mud on it. That's that's kind of what I think about. And then ARDS. Um, ARDS is going to be a um, very ominous um, disease process. It's caused by many factors, but mostly when you look at the literature, you look at the research papers, ARDS is caused by us as clinicians not providing the proper ventilator management um, or the proper care as it relates to um, um, oxygenation and um, uh, the strategies involved with the ventilator management, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so all that to be said, we have to understand what's going on after the gas exchange happens, right? So cellular um, metabolism is, is what I'm talking about. And so we're talking about either aerobic metabolism or anaerobic metabolism. And so we'll start with aerobic metabolism, and it's dependent on a few things, okay? The two main things that are the aerobic metabolism needs is it needs sugar, which everything in our body needs sugar, and it needs oxygen. And so that's where the term aerobic comes from, oxygen, an oxygen-rich environment. We have to have also the ability to carry CO2. So we have to have an abundance of hemoglobin, right? So where that would come into to play is if you have a trauma patient, and that trauma patient's bled out, and so you've decreased your oxygen carrying capacity. Um, the third thing we need, we need to have a good cardiac output, okay? And that's kind of twofold because when you look at really the, the deep pathophysiology regarding cardiac output, cardiac output is dependent on oxygenation, um, and that's called the Fick principle. Um, so if you have a decreased oxygenation state, it is going to directly affect cardiac output. Um, and then the fourth thing is you have to have the ability to extract O2 to the cells. Um, and that's where that oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve is, is really important to understand, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but you have to be able to get the oxygen-rich um, molecules to the t cells, to the tissues, so you have um, tissue oxygenation. So aerobic metabolism, how does that, how does that work? Um, again, you have to have sugar, and you have to have glucose. So a lack of either of those is going to impede that aerobic um, or that ATP production, the aerobic metabolism. So remember in a cell you have mitochondria and the fuel that fuels the cell is ATP. So everything we do, um, our body's trying to produce more ATP that you know produces heat, it produces the energy of the cell, and, and that's the whole process of aerobic metabolism. Okay, so we have to have oxygen, we have to have glucose, and the end product is ATP molecules, okay? That means we have more energy. If we have a lack of either one of those, you're going to have a byproduct of lactic acid, all right? And we're going to talk about that in here in a second. Obviously, our body has an abundance of sugar built up. Even if we have a low sugar state, our body is going to produce anything it can to sugar. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make its own sugar. So we have an abundance of sugar. Um, so the, the thing that we're lacking is the oxygen. So that's where, where I always say we need to optimize our oxygenation in whatever way we can. Okay, so continuing on the aerobic metabolism. So what happens is, is you have, you're trying to get aerobic energy. You're trying to get, again, 36 to 38 ATP molecules. That's the end product of aerobic metabolism. This whole process is called glycolysis, okay? And so the process of glycolysis is you have sugar and you have oxygen. This process of glycolysis starts and it produces what's called pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid then is converted and it's, it's put into the Krebs cycle and it produces the electron transport chain which again 
produces ATP, and we're, we get 36 to 38 ATP molecules um, in that process. Like I said in the beginning of this presentation, I'm not going to go into great depth on the Krebs cycle, on the electron tra transport chain. I'm going to do that in a further podcast. Um, but just know that that's kind of the, the quick process of what happens to um, get those ATP molecules that are essential for cellular energy. When we talk about anaerobic metabolism, that's a lack of oxygen. So you have a lack of oxygen in the process, and it eliminates the Krebs cycle and the electron tra transport change from that, that algorithm that I just talked about. And so you have the glycolysis. The glycolysis turns into um, pyruvic acid. The pyruvic acid then turns into lactic acid. And the reason why it does that, it, it's missing that oxygen, that oxygen molecule to convert it to the Krebs cycle to the electron trans transport chain and it produces lactic acid. Okay, so that's the anaerobic state. So anaerobic means with a lack of oxygen. So why, why is lactate important? I'm not going to hit this real hard right now. Again, this is uh, you know, part of the oxygenation thing, but um, lactate, um, our normal lactate levels are anything below 2.5. Okay, if you, if you did a lab or anything below 2.5 is normal. Um, and so what used to be um, indicative of maybe cellular hypoxia is now more of a, of a marker, that, a biomarker that looks at um, how sick the patient really is. And so any point above 2.5 gives the patient a 10% mortality rate. So if you had a lactate level of, of 7.5, you have a 50% mortality rate. And so um, that's something that uh, flying I haven't really seen um, in the smaller facilities. I don't really see physicians drawing a lactate level. Um, that's something that's seen in the bigger facilities, maybe more more advanced, uh, more research oriented. Um, but it's an important uh, important marker. So if you do happen to do a transfer, whether you're a ground medic right now or you're, you know, um, a flight paramedic, flight nurse, uh, and you are able to see a lactate level and it's it's high and it matches the etiology of what the patient's going on. You know, what's going on? Are they septic? Are they they have pneumonia or whatever? Um, you know, you, you may need to be a little bit more aggressive, and, and that'll kind of give you an idea of where they're at. Okay, um, so it causes causes of anaerobic metabolism, obviously a hypoxic hypoxic state. So there's multiple levels of shock, and you know we've learned in school um, different levels of shock, um, but we can break those levels down into even smaller categories. So the first one is called hypoxic hypoxia, and that's basically a deficiency in alveolar O2 exchange. Okay, so again, hypoxic hypoxia. Uh, the second one is going to be hypemic hypoxia, and what this is is a reduction of O2 carrying capacity. Like I said, if you had a trauma situation or a trauma patient with, um, you know, that's hemorrhaging and bleeding out, um, their oxygen carrying capacity is is being depleted, and that's going to be a hypemic hypoxia. Hixo, um, histotoxic hypoxia is a result of poisoning, um, ETOH, CO poisoning, anything like that um, that, that's going to be more cellular, um, uh, that's going to be a histotoxic hypoxia. And then the last one is going to be a stagnant hypoxia. And so this is where you have obstructive shocks, uh, PEs, um, tension pneumos, pericardial tamponades, things like that that cause a, an obstructive shock. Um, all right, so we have the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve, and for some of you, you've heard of this. For some of you, you haven't, and it's hard for me to um, kind of show you this. Um, I'll talk about it briefly, um, but I really have some pictures that would um, better illustrate what I'm talking about. But basically, imagine a graph. You have an x and a y axis, and you have um, a line coming from the, the corner, the left lower corner, and you're you got this this nice waveform that comes up and you have a middle you have a right and a left line okay and what this means all this is is you have a normal curve and a normal curve means that you have an oxygen molecule that jumps on your hemoglobin your hemoglobin um, then disperses that oxygen molecule to the tissues appropriately there's no block, there's no shunt, there's nothing stopping that from happening. 
And so I've made some analogies, and, and these are kind of corny, but um, I'll read these analogies to you. So think of a normal curve as a manual for dating. In a normal healthy relationship, you enjoy your partner's company so you have a high affinity for them. So what that means is the oxygen molecules jump on to the hemoglobin appropriately. But you don't mind dropping them off after an evening out because you know you'll see them again. So everything is, is perfect. Oxygen molecules jump on, and they jump off, and everything's good. And then you have what's called a right shift. And all that means is, is that you have that curve on the right-hand side, so you have another line on the right. And although this isn't a normal thing, a right curve is better than a left curve. Okay, so the left curve we'll talk about here in a second. That's a bad thing. A right curve um, is, although not normal, it's all right. So they say a right curve is right for the patient. And what that means is that there's a decreased affinity. Okay, so what that means is your oxygen molecule jumps on and it immediately jumps off and it's it, your tissues are over oxygenated is what that means so you can see that that's kind of a good thing um, it's not going to be terrible for the for the patient um, things just aren't working appropriately so my analogy there is your picker outer is broken so you tend to pick out duds and your duds are far and few between but they're duds so you have no problem dropping them off so again this is a right shift and it's it's right for the patient Okay, so a left curve is um, not a good thing. And a left curve means that there's increased affinity. And when I mean affinity, I mean that the hemoglobin um, is attracting that oxygen molecule more than it should. And so that's what I mean by less affinity or greater affinity. So the analogy goes like this. You really like your person you're dating, high affinity, but you're not secure in the relationship, so you're so reluctant to let them go, your picker outer is broken, uh, so you have poor drop-off. So you have uh, easy pickup, but poor drop-off. So imagine the oxygen molecule are just hoarded with all these oxygen, um, or the hemoglobin is hoarded with all these oxygen molecules. They're not being dispersed to the tissues. So this is where you're going to have a person that has tissue hypoxia. And how are we going to know this? You know, when we apply this to our patient management, I always like to, you know, all this is great to know, but how can we apply this to our patient care? How can we put this in our toolbox? So imagine we, we go to an ICU for a transfer, we have a patient on a ventilator, and they hand you a blood gas. And the blood gas has been given two days ago, uh, uh, from two hours ago. They've been on the ventilator for about a week. And you look at their blood gas, and their PO2 is 50 okay and we know a normal PO2 is 80 to 100 so this is going to give you an idea that they have no reserves they've been on a ventilator they've been properly oxygenated for a week um, you know depending on what FiO2 they were set on and um, they're still tissue hypoxic and so a good um, way to figure out what they should be on their PO2 is you take whatever FiO2 they've been on and you times that by five so if they've been on a 50% FiO2, then their PO2 should be 250, okay? So anything um, FiO2-wise, you times that by 5, and that's what their PO2 should be if everything was working appropriately. So you can see if a patient was on uh, FiO2 of 50 for a week straight and their PO2 is still only 50, you know that there's a shunt. They're not getting oxygenated appropriately. And that's why they're this left curve on, you know, a left shift on the hemoglobin curve. Um, and so the important thing to realize here is they're going to be very brittle. If you stop bagging them, if you, if, you, if you stop in any way, they have no reserves. And so their sats are going to fall. They're going to plummet very quickly. And so that's something to kind of keep in mind. Again, we'll, we'll kind of hit that a little bit more in depth. I'll talk about why. There's a left shift versus a right shift. What causes those things versus acidosis, alkalosis, etc. All right. So, as part of that, let's kind of move to um, quickly to modes of ventilation, um, or I should say, uh, let's talk about um, 
kind of terminology regarding modes of ventilation. Um, so your modes of ventilation uh, or terminology, you know, you have tidal volume. So our tidal volume is a normal volume of air inspired with each breath, okay, in a respiratory cycle. E each one is expressed in milliliters. Um, it always should be sufficient to overcome dead space um, and uh, supply the alveoli with oxygen. And so remember, dead space is anything, um, the ET tube is dead space, the vent circuit's dead space, and so we lose about 100 to 150 mils of volume per breath because of dead space. And we'll talk about why that's important later on. Um, your tidal volume should be 4 to 8 mils per kilogram of, of ideal body weight. And what I mean by ideal body weight, I mean that um, you should never estimate somebody off of their what they look like, they, what they weigh. You should always estimate off of their height. And I've got a formula later on in this presentation that will uh, allow you to do that very quickly. Um, the big thing on tidal volume is research is showing that the tidal volumes, um, low tidal volumes are a lot better for your patient. Um, patient outcome is better. Um, it showed that uh, tidal volume, high tidal volumes of 10 to 12 mils per breath did, uh, did not um, improve patient outcome. It actually um, caused increased mortality. It caused uh, ventilator lung-induced injury, which leads to ARDS. And so that same study showed that patients uh, with tidal volumes to f of 4 to 6 mils per kilogram uh, had uh, lower mortality rates, um, significantly lower ventilator uh, lung-induced injury, uh, problems, uh, less inflammatory cascade problems, uh, you know, the incidence of ARDS was lower and death obviously was lower. So all that to be said, lower tidal volumes um, are, are much better for your patient. Next thing we want to talk about is respiratory rate. And respiratory rate equals ventilation. Okay, so your tidal volume, think about tidal volume as oxygenation um, and respiratory rate is ventilation. So this should be based on the approach of treatment. Um, I, I kind of break this down um, by approach, and um, I use um, what's called the ARGENET study. The ARGENET study is a study that I learned about um, basically in another podcast that I had listened to a few years ago. Uh, went on um, the ARDS uh, Net um, website. I, I, you know, I read a lot about it. Um, I really believe in it. I've used that approach on uh, many, many patients, and uh, you know, I think it's wonderful. So. Um, it's a good way to um, be able to identify different patient subsets quickly and um, have that approach tailored to them. Um, and I found it a lot easier to manage my patients once I thought about it this way. So, you know, it's nothing um, that's out of the ordinary. You're still going to approach your patients essentially the same. It's just you're kind of categorizing them differently and uh, approaching it in a different manner. So again, your respiratory rate should be based on the approach of treatment. Um, it's going to reflect the patient's work of breathing, um, your ventilatory status, and your pH. And um, remember that your um, pH is everything when we talk about uh, your patient. You know, you look at blood gas and everybody gets cued in on their PaCO2 or, you know, their bicarb, but really pH drives everything in the body. So, um, you know, you're, you, you need to... You need to be looking at your blood gases. You need to be trying to um, understand that. And we'll, we'll talk about that in further podcasts. Um, think about your patient. And, you know, obviously based on the approach, you know, is a higher respiratory rate going to be better or is a lower respiratory rate going to be better? Um, who's going to benefit from either one? Um, if you're talking about a COPD or asthma patient, those patients need a lower respiratory rate because they need time to exhale. That's the basis of, of their problem is they don't have enough time to exhale and they they form auto peep and they're breath stacking on top of e, um, each other. So if you if you think about a respirator of 20, um, the patient's ex, uh, exhalation process may be half over and they're already trying to take another breath. And so that, that breath doesn't allow the, the rest of that CO2 to be expelled and you just start having a, you know, cascade of problems based on that. So a lower respiratory rate in that situation um, is going to be better. FiO2 is going to be uh, uh, your next thing to, to kind of look at. FiO2, remember, we breathe at 21% oxygen um, or uh, on the ventilator it, it may be represented as 0.21. And so 
when we talk about um, FiO2, um, too much oxygen is, is a bad thing, and I'm not going to hammer this real big, but you know, oxygen is a biological toxin. We have enzymes, we have uh, processes in place in our body that, that convert that and utilize it properly, but it really isn't a great thing, and we don't need an abundance of oxygen. We, you know, we live just fine on 21%. So, um, you know, for short transports, short durations, 100% FiO2 is fine. But when we're talking maybe long-term care, you know, over, you know, days, uh, weeks, um, lower FiO2s are essential. And um, uh, it can lead to many, many problems if you, if you don't um, tailor back that FiO2 to, to uh, you know, close to physiologic norm. All right, everything we talk about ventilator management-wise, we, we need to look at minute ventilation. And minute ventilation drives everything. Um, minute ventilation is your tidal volume and times your rate. And this is expressed in either mils or liters per minute. So an average minute ventilation for you or I, non-innovated, is 4 to 8 liters per minute. And that's what we take in based on our tidal volume times our rate. Um, so that's that's really important to be monitoring to be looking at um, and uh, it's going to become evident later in this presentation why that's so important because we, when we take into account dead space and um, what we're truly getting at the alveolar level um, you'll find that maybe in the past we haven't been doing a very good job um, maintaining a proper minute ventilation. Um, exhale tidal volume you're going to see this labeled as a, a big V as in Victor and a little T little E um, so that's going to be exhale tidal volume. This is the most accurate measurement of volume received by the patient. So this is what's getting ex exhaled. Um, actual breath to breath, breath to breath variations could be anywhere from, you know, 25 to 75 mils um, either way. So if you're putting in 500 on your tidal volume, you may get out 425. You may get out 525. It just depends on, on the patient. Um, but don't get alarmed if you're only getting out, you know, 400 if, if, if you're putting in five. Just as long as the patient is maintaining a good SAT, their entitled to CO2 um, is, is maintaining um, an, in the norms. You're not having any big deviations. Um, you're hemodynamically stable. You know, you're not seeing any major problems. You know, I wouldn't get too worried about things like that. Uh, most ventilators have what's called a trigger. And a trigger is used, um, allows the patient to initiate a breath. So when we're talking about um, assist control or SIMV or, you know, modes that allow the patient to take their own um, breath or initiate their own breath, um, the trigger is, is a number set from 1 to, you know, 9, 1 to 12, depending on the ventilator. And so the lower the number, the easier it is for the patient to initiate that breath. And so what I try to... Um, give examples of imagine holding onto a tube and on a number one setting you're barely compressing that tube and so the patient has to exert enough pressure on their own to open up that circuit and it, the ventilator senses that and allows them to take a breath. If it's set at a, at, a, at a nine let's say imagine just squeezing that down hard and so you can imagine the patient having to really exert a lot of pressure. And so this is this is used in the weaning, um, and uh, you know maintaining the patient's musculature. You know you don't want to knock them all all down to where they they lose any muscle tone or anything like that, any drive to breathe. Um, obviously, in some patient subsets, that's all right short term, but you know we should always be trying to wean our patients off the ventilator. Um, I to E ratio. Um, this is your inspiratory versus expiratory time. This is a this is something I see a lot of flight crew members um, that they don't utilize this. They don't really understand this. They forget this in their toolbox. And you're going to hear me say toolbox a lot. And I feel like we have all these different tools that we have gained over the years. And this is a really important one when it when it as it relates to ventilator management. And so basically, what this is is the time spent in the inspiration versus the exhalation process. And so a standard IDE ratio is about one to two. And so to give you an example of what that means, if you took a patient that was on a respirator of 10 and you t divided that by 60 seconds, which is one minute, so they're taking 10 breaths in one minute, that would give you a six second um, 
ventilatory cycle. And so if you had a 1 to 2 uh, ratio, you would have a 2 second ins inspiration cycle and a 4 second exhalation cycle. Now, you're always going to have um, you know, different patients with different physiologic norms, um, but for the most part, a 1 to 2 um, IE ratio to start out with it is appropriate. Now, when, when you want to change that is when you get into the different subsets of patients. So if you had an asthma patient, and a COPD patient, a patient that's retaining CO2, then you would want a, to extend that exhalation time out. So extend it to 1 to 3, 1 to 4, 1 to 5. Um, pediatric patients are synonymous to where they need a little bit longer time to exhale. Remember, they have a faster respiratory rate. And so with that, they need a longer exhalation cycle. You know, if you don't give them time to exhale, um, they're going to start stacking breaths again, and, and you're going to start having problems. And then you can even inverse your ID ratio where you give a longer inhalation um, phase and a shorter exhalation phase. And that might be somebody that's very hypoxic, uh, maybe an ARDS patient that's extremely hypoxic, needs a longer inspiratory phase. Um, so that's where you would go into the inverse ID ratios. But I don't recommend using those unless you're real comfortable with all facets of ventilator management um, because it can get kind of complicated. Um, so let's talk about auto PEEP. Um, auto PEEP um, is air trapping essentially. Remember, you know, these patients um, are COPD asthma patients. Um, it's not going to be an oxygenation problem. Uh, it's going to be a ventilation failure. So the patients can't exhale due to the effort it takes in the expiration process. Remember in the beginning of the presentation, we talked about that the, that the exhalation process is an active process that takes a lot of energy. And so because they have this um, lung fatigue or the muscle fatigue, um, this leads to air trapping and auto peep. So it will obviously cause hypercarbia. And, you know, it can cause um, increased pressures in the chest, inner, inner thoracic pressures, um, decreased venous return. You can have hemodynamic problems because of it. So, you know, this is a big deal to, 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 uh, to these patients to try to, you know, correct this issue. Um, so on your ventilator, you're going to have multiple alarms. You're going to have multiple um, readings that the, the ventilator will do for you. So the first one that, that's pretty popular is called a peak pressure or a, a peak inspiratory pressure. So this pressure um, is measured in a volume control ventilation. It's a measurement of a pressure of the upper airways, uh, the ET tube, the vent circuit, uh, bronchial tubes, and you know we want to try to keep this number below 40. Um, different literature will tell you different things. You know, I've heard um, teachings where physicians really don't look at this. Um, they don't really take um, this as a, as a big deal. You know, they feel like if you have a, a COPD or asthma patient that's got some bronchial constriction, of course the peak inspiratory pressure is going to be high. It's not really telling them anything. I've also heard teachings where, you know, you got to look at it in a different different way. Where if you have a higher pressure um, based on, um, you know, compliance um, deficiencies or narrowing airways, it's going to take um, that same volume that you're putting in, it's going to make that volume cause more pressure at the end. So what I'm trying to say is, is if you have a normal bronchial that's, um, you know, let's say, we'll just say two inches um, wide, and you put a volume of air in there, um, the pressure as it as it gets to the to the alveoli, that pressure is not going to be as high because of there's less resistance for that air as it travels down the bronchioles. If you have that same amount of volume and it's going down a bronchial tree that's maybe a half um, uh, an inch um, in diameter or in width, that same volume is going to exert a bigger pressure at the end. So you're going to have more pressure exerted against the alveoli. And so you can have um, barotrauma because of it. And so when I heard that, you know, I had never heard that teaching, but when I heard it, it made sense to me. Um, because so you, you got to think of compliance and volume is going to equal pressure. And that pressure is going to be the 
pressure exerted against the alveoli. So that's where trying to keep that peak inspiratory pressure below 40 is essential um, because it can cause um, ventilator lung induced injury and we know that um, that's the starting cascade for ARDS. It starts that inflammatory cascade and um, you know it leads to ARDS. So that's, that's uh, very important to understand. Now the most important reading, the most important pressure that we're going to be looking at on our ventilator is called our plateau pressure or our PAW. You'll see it on the ventilator labeled as PAW. And so this is a, a measurement of the pressure at the alveolar level, most important reading to look at again. And we want to keep this reading below 30. Um, and so this is, a, this is a direct indication of alve alveolar function. It's consistently um, looked at for alveolar health. And, um, you know, if we have prolonged um, high plateau pressures above 30, again, it's going to cause ventilator lung-induced injury. And this, this is directly affecting the uh, alveoli. Um, so, you know, we don't, we don't want to do this. So this is going to tell you a lot of things. Um, you know, you're going to initially put your patients on the ventilator. You're going to have them um, um, sedated appropriately, and you're going to do a inspiratory hold. Um, it's a button on all ventilators. You do an inspiratory hold. It'll come up on the menu, and it'll say uh, plateau pressure, and you're going to document that plateau pressure. And you're going to do that any time you put a patient on the ventilator, and then you're going you're gonna to reassess that. Um, so what happens if it's high? How are we going to correct for that if it's high? Um, we talked earlier about your tidal volume, and your tidal volume range is 4 to 8 mils per kilogram. So I like to start at 6 mils per kilogram. I'm not a big component on starting high, so I like the 4 to 6. I start at 6, and so remember what I said. Your volume times compliance is going to equal pressure. So that's that volume that we put in. We can we can change that volume. If we if we started at six mils per kilogram on our tidal volume, um, let's say we had a hundred kilogram patient, right? So we have six hundred on our tidal volume. Then if we can decrease that volume, and that's going to affect pressure at the alveolar level, then reduce that to five mils per kilogram. So drop it to five hundred on your tidal volume. And reassess your plateau pressure. If you still have a high plateau pressure above thirty, then you're going to drop your your volume to four mils per kilogram. So more, more four mils per kilogram is uh, going to be a 400 tidal volume on that 100 kilogram patient. So with that, that's where you're going to stop. You never want to go below four mils per kilogram. That's that's your stopping point. Um, and then at that point, we need to try to figure out if we haven't changed our plateau pressure. Why is our plateau pressure high? We we've tried to decrease our plateau pressure due to volume. So now we want to look at our patient. Is it high because you have a trauma um, in the lung? Do you have a pneumothorax? Is it converting to a tension pneumothorax? Do we need to decompress the chest? Um, do you have um, ARDS where you have just all this pressure, this fluid built up around the alveoli? You know, what can we do to try to alleviate that? So we'll talk about this a little bit in more depth uh, further um, on in the presentation, um, probably part two. Um, but just know that plateau pressure is everything. Keep that plateau pressure below 30. Reassess that constantly, especially if you if you have indications that this, it's high or close to being at 30. You want to constantly reassess this and try to correct that because that's what's going to cause uh, major problems with your patients. Um, peep, uh, peep is a uh, peep is a good thing. Um, um, the biggest thing with peep is. Um, I think people under, misunderstand PEEP. I don't think people will utilize this correctly. Um, and always think of this as the quickest way to increase oxygenation. Uh, it's the pressure that's applied at the airway at the end of ex the expiration process. And um, you're basically maintaining alveolar recruitment. So when we have our inspiration uh, phase, you're recruiting alveoli, so the volume that you put in, you're you're expanding the chest out, and you're recruiting that alveoli. We've got to maintain that alveoli as well, and maintaining alveoli is by PEEP. I think a lot of people think that PEEP is responsible for recruitment, and it's not. It, it's, re it's responsible for maintaining recruitment. So you have two facets there. So you need to have an appropriate tidal volume that's going to recruit alveoli, but not damage alveoli, right? So we don't want too much volume, too much pressure. And then you want 
a, an appropriate amount of PEEP that um, maintains that recruitment. And so those same studies that I talked about earlier in the presentation, those same studies showed that patients with lower tidal volumes of the 4 to 8 mils per kilogram and higher PEEPs, you know, anywhere from, you know, 10 to 15 did better than patients with a high tidal volume and lower PEEPs. So PEEP is a good thing, guys. PEEP is, 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 is essential. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to increase FCR. You're trying to increase functional residual capacity. Um, this allows for um, that glass door we talked about, that alveolar membrane. It allows for more molecules uh, colliding with that glass door. It br makes that glass door bigger. Um, it, uh, you know, reaches alveoli that may be um, in the dependent lung fields that, that aren't getting reached. Um, so PEEP is a, a really good thing. Um, it, it, you know, it improves oxygenation, uh, reducing VQ mismatch. Um, you know, it, I can't say enough things about it. You know, obviously there's a few circumstances where you're going to want lower PEEPs. Um, in those COPD asthma patients that already have the high auto PEEP, they're not going to benefit from, from PEEP. Um, so, you know, in those patients, just turning the PEEP off or putting a PEEP of two to three is going to be probably best. But um, for purposes of, of all the other patient subsets, uh, PEEP is, is excellent. All right, pressure support is a, another um, um, aspect of ventilator management. And so pressure support is an augmentation, um, and it's used in conjunction with SIMV or pressure control ventilation and basically this is an excellent way to augment the patient's attempt of spontaneous breathing um, it, it's only utilized when the patient in initiates their own breath so you know obviously they have to be on a mode that they're able to initiate their own breath um, SIMV pressure control ventilation and it's basically air that allows the patient to breathe easier it helps them initiate that breath it uh, helps that breath get delivered easier so um, it's a great thing um, I always think of it kind of as a turbo boost um, or like a just an invisible river in the ventilator circuit and it, it just pushes that breath along uh, uh, in more uh, more ease for the patient so where do we put that at we put it anywhere from you know five to ten above our peep that's that's kind of where i start so if i have my peep at five i'll put my pressure support at 15. Um, and I, I haven't read and you know i may be wrong but i haven't read or ever heard of any um, poor um, attributes to peep pressure support uh, you know I don't, I don't it's not a bad thing okay so at this point we're going to stop with part one this has been pretty extensive as far as you know we've already gone about 45 minutes um, we'll, we'll do part two here in about a week and um, we're going to start going over volume control modes pressure control modes and you know we'll continue down um, the modes of ventilation and then part three is going to be um, how we approach those patients and how we um, subcategorize those uh, based on our approach um, so we'll be doing either an obstructive approach or we're going to be doing an injury approach and it's very easy to subdivide those patients based on that. It's easy to manage them. Um, and, um, you know, I think once you've gone through this whole thing, I think you'll be better, better uh, apt to uh, uh, make changes to your ventilator and, you know, be more comfortable. So, again, thank you for joining me. Um, we, uh, we look forward to your comments. Email me any suggestions. Email me uh, topic ideas or anything like that, any questions. And um, I'll answer them as soon as I can. Um, so we'll talk to you soon.